It is truly gratifying to return to this pulpit, to the feel of this wood, <laughs> and to the faces gathered here today, and to those of you gathered online. Um, I deeply appreciate the time that you give, the commitment and the love that you have for this church. I have an odd habit, it occurs to me, I have a lot of odd habits, <laughs> but I have an odd habit, it occurs to me that um, particularly when it gets hot out, I start wishing for the cold, and when it's cold out, I certainly wish for the hot. <laughs> but this week I was remembering a cold February morning this past February, and it was interesting because uh, that morning it was colder than it had been for a while. It was a relatively mild winter, at least from where I was sitting. And I was sitting on a bench at a bus stop just off DuPont Circle in Washington, waiting for the G2 bus, which was going to take me to the gates of Georgetown University. I had my headphones in listening to Liz Wright, who was bringing a soulful light to me on a cloudy day. I was bundled up, like I said, it was cold, and I was wearing my, my mask, both because it was mandatory for public transportation, of course, and one of the things, and well, one of the nice things about wearing a mask, particularly that I found in winter, beyond doing my bit to protect myself and others from pandemic, was that it kept my face warm, <laughs> um, so I didn't mind wearing it. In any case, I was warm, despite the chill, and I was relaxed with Liz Wright playing in my ears and enjoying my commute to campus. She caught my eye as she crossed P Street. She had a kind of shuffling gait, sometimes given to us as we age, or as the world has weighed us down for so long that we can barely keep up, keep up our feet. She too was bundled against the cold in a long oversized coat and a knit hat that was far too big. In fact, I think what I noticed is that everything seemed too big for her, the coat, the hat, the scarf, her shoes, the street, the city. She came into the bus shelter and sat down opposite side from me. And I glanced over and I did that, my best smile with the eyes thing that we've practiced for the last couple of years. Not always trusting that it didn't come off as kind of creepy. I probably should have practiced it in a mirror more. She kind of nodded back. She asked me which bus was coming. I said I was waiting for the G2 bus, but that the D2 was coming just around the circle and would be here soon. I got very used to what buses were coming. How long to the G2, she said. About 10 minutes, I guessed, and returned my focus to the music in my ears. Do you know any place I can get some food? I'm sorry, what? As I pulled the earpiece out of my ear. Do you know any place I can get some food? I've got three grandbabies at home and they need food and my check don't come for another week. And my heart broke and sank and did all those things a heart does when confronted with the acute sufferings in this world. Along with compassionate feelings, I also felt my defenses rise, grounded in my own fears of loss, even in the privilege and abundance of my life. No, I, I'm sorry, I really don't know. She went on before I even finished. Do you know of any churches that's got food? I smiled behind the mask at the irony. Here I was, the minister of a church. 
which she could not have known. But man, I was feeling confronted by that question. And the question wasn't really confrontational at all, but I felt that. I shook my head, no, I'm sorry, I'm not really familiar with, wait, there's a church a few blocks down P Street from here. The bus passes. I already been there. They ran out last week. Sorry, I really don't know. And my mind began to race around trying to figure out how to help this woman and her grandbabies who simply or complexly needed food. I pondered just giving her some cash, right? But I don't carry cash anymore. I, I didn't have any on me. And honestly, she wouldn't ask me for that. I'm so sorry, I said. I'm just not familiar enough with what the city has to help. <laughs> the city, she laughed. The city don't help. And then we began to talk about the cold snap, the mask mandate, the fear we have from getting sick, the weariness we shared in trying to be vigilant and careful. She told me a bit about those grandbabies, not really babies anymore, it turns out. They're all middle school and high school age, although they've not been in school much the last couple of years. She talked a lot, told me lots of things, and I said very little, mostly nodding and mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And the more she talked, the more I wanted to help and the more helpless I felt. The D2 bus comes and goes, and I could see my bus approaching from the other side of DuPont Circle, and she stood and stretched her back, and, and I said, I was sorry, I couldn't be more helpful. She said, you know, it's just nice to have someone to listen. The G2 arrived, we glanced at each other and waved. There's a story in the Christian scriptures that occurs only in one book. Um, if you read the Gospels, a lot of the times the stories get repeated. But this only shows up in Luke. It's in Luke 13. And the basic story is, is that Jesus is at a synagogue and he's teaching. And this was at a time when he had become, in my imagination at least, kind of a minor celebrity. Right, I suppose. And I'm kind of envisioning the synagogue pretty full of people who had heard about this Nazarene and his band of followers and showed up to see if he was the real deal. Or maybe they showed up secretly hoping he wasn't. We do that too. Anyway, he's there and there's a crowd and slipping in the back, trying really, really hard to be unnoticed was a woman, and she's described as having a spirit that had crippled her for 18 years, and her back was bent over. And I think a lot about what it would take for that woman to be in the synagogue on that day. Because you see, in first century Palestine, when they talk about a woman with a spirit that has crippled her for 18 years, they literally mean a spirit an evil spirit. According to her community, the people in her community, this woman had clearly been cursed by God. And this curse, this evil spirit had disfigured her, forced her back into an arch, made it so she couldn't even lift her head and look anyone in the eye. And the thing you have to know about people that have been cursed by God, right? You don't want to be near them. Lest you be cursed by association, lest you catch whatever she's got. You don't even want to see them. When you pass by them on the street, you look the other way. You shield your children's eyes. You pretend she doesn't exist. So we have this woman shunned by her community, but, you know, not deaf. She hears the whispers. 
She knows who's coming to town. She's heard of this great rabbi. Maybe, she thinks, maybe if she waits in the shade until everyone else has gone in to listen, maybe she could sneak in the back door and no one would notice. But who cares? Even if somebody did notice, they would say anything. They ignore her anyway, right? So I think that's what she does. She sneaks in, stays by the door in case anyone tries to say anything to her, but of course no one does. Hidden in the shadows, her head bent to the floor as always. She can't see the great teacher, but she can hear him. You in the back. You in the back. Yes, you woman, come here. Can you imagine how terrified she would have been hearing those words? I'm guessing she's going for the door. No, you woman, come over here to me. And a hush falls on the crowd, right? And suddenly, bent over, all she sees is the feet of the people begin to move to the side. And suddenly she feels the silent stares of everyone in that room resting on her bent over body. And never mind all the reasons not to, all the reasons to stay hidden, to stay in the margins. In that moment, she begins to shuffle, not to the door, but towards the voice. Yeah, that's right. Come here. And then come the words. You are set free from your ailment. And on her back, she feels the warm hands of this man. And she begins to straighten the arch until she can see him eye to smiling eye. The funny thing about these miracle stories, they're almost never about what, they think, what you think they're about, right? Never about what they appear to be about. Now, I wasn't there, just to be clear, when Jesus laid his hands on this woman, so I don't know what really happened. The text tells us he healed her, it tells us that the crowd rejoiced at the healing. It tells us that subsequent to the healing, the religious authorities begin this argument with Jesus about the whole healing a person on the Sabbath thing, which I'm pretty certain means they missed the entire point. Here's my take. Jesus saw this woman when everyone else did not. He saw her when everyone else did was so practiced at not seeing. He saw her suffering, he saw her pain, and he called her out, called her forward, out of the shadows, out of the shadows of her society, out of the places of shame and fear, out into the community that may, had made her invisible. And in so doing, she became seen. She became visible. She became restored to her humanity, restored to her community. At least I'd like to think that. Don't know what happened the day after, right? But I think in that simple act of seeing her, of calling her into the community, Jesus was demonstrating the power of awakening to love. In that moment, the crowd maybe minus the religious leaders, <laughs> the crowd was awakened. And the woman was awakened. And if you need that to be called a miracle, then feel free to. Perhaps, though, it's not so miraculous. We just have to get over ourselves a little bit. Anyway, my encounter with the woman at the bus stop reminded me of that story in Luke. 
but probably not how you're thinking. It'd be fun to claim that at that bus stop, I was like Jesus. Yeah. Seeing and listening to this woman, somehow being a healing presence for her. But let's be honest, I'm not Jesus. I'm not your Savior. And I'm sorry if that disappoints. But quite honestly, given what we tend to do with saviors, I think I'll keep to my business. <laughs> I mostly think that in that story of the bent over woman, I am the crowd. The crowd that tries hard to avoid, to suppress, to ignore the suffering around us. We are the crowd that wants to be good but mostly just acts to protect itself. Regardless of the way our ambivalence eats at our heart and soul. The crowd that would just as soon remain in blissful slumber rather than to take the risk to see and be seen. To risk knowing and to be known. To risk loving and to risk being loved. When we are the crowd, we protect our hearts. And one of the best ways I've found to protect my heart is try to fix everything so I don't have to risk love. I try to fix everything. So I don't have to risk love. Because, but here's the thing, right? Love isn't ever about fixing things. It's about presence. It's about suffering with. It's about seeing the humanity in others and having our full humanity with all of its wounds and scars and ugliness and fears be exposed to another person? So when the bent over woman shuffles across P Street and asks me where she might be able to get food for her for grandbabies, I instantly go into fix-it mode, right? Thinking that if I can just fix this problem, I can stay in the safety of my slumber and not risk being awakened. But the thing was, on that February morning, I knew something, the truest thing I knew. I didn't have any way to fix it. I didn't. I didn't have cash that I could give her. I didn't know where she could go to help. And even if I did or could help her this morning, what was going to happen the next day? And the day after that? And the day after that? I felt so helpless against the enormity of the situation. So, barring any real way to fix it, I simply shut up and listened. Hush. Hush now. Hush, listen to the love that she has for her children and her grandchildren. Hush now. Hush, listen to the determination and resilience that love fueled in her. Hush, hush now. Listen to the love arising in me. Listen for the blessing that blazes among us when we finally listen into the chaos and when we breathe together at long last. When the G2 bus hissed to the stop, I apologized that I couldn't be more helpful. And she said, it's just nice to have someone to listen. And it was then I awoke. It was then I awoke. I am not Jesus. 
And it turns out I'm not the crowd either. I am. We are the bent over woman, seeking sustenance for those we love, but mostly just yearning for someone to listen, to see us, to know us to be whole and holy, so that we too might awaken to love. Amen, my friends, and may we live in blessing.